Well, good morning. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're at this morning, and it's where we've been for a little while. Um, man, how what a great week it's been. So thankful um, for so many of you. I think we had 60-plus students and, and uh, adults uh, on our team this week serving these kiddos, and, and uh, we're praying that the, the gospel, the message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus was planted deeply in, in their life and in their heart. And uh, we pray that that, that it's true. Um, we have been in uh, this chapter, Matthew. It's a, a teaching of Jesus where he is going through um, what's called parables. And uh, these are stories that Jesus told that uh, if you've been here, we're, we're, what we've been saying is that these are not just cute little stories that Jesus told to pass on to your grandkids. These are not just stories that, that Jesus told to just clarify some things to his crowd. Um, but these are stories that Jesus was telling to upend our life, to change the way that you think about life, to get your allegiance away from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom uh, of God. And so th- these were the stories that Jesus told. These were the stories that had, that had Jesus put to death, that Rome killed Jesus for, because he was transferring people's allegiance from Caesar and Rome to, to God, to the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and so th- these are stories meant to shape us, to meant to, to, to think about the reality of, of life and, and the reality of heaven and, and completely change the way in which we live, li- the way in which we think, and the way in which we live. And so as we get started this morning, I, just want, I have a question for you um, to just think about, to, to ponder. And that is this, what does the good life look like for you? Like when you think about the good life, when you think about like what your life would need to, to be, to, to, to have the good life, like what does it need? What, what do you, when you think about your life, what, what, would have to, what would you have to have for it to be considered the good life? What does your relationships, what, what does your family have to have to thrive? What does your job have to have? What would, what would your recreation look like? What would, inter, what would your entertainment, what would your retirement, what, if you were living the good life, what would have to be in place for you to say, I am living the good life? That is the good life. This is the good life. What would your life have to have to be the good life? Over, over the years, I, I've gone on some mission trips to different countries, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and many of them were in like impoverished areas, some third world countries. And, and, uh, and, and it's interesting that whenever we come back from one of those trips, I've said it, I've heard people say it, um, but you'll always hear something like this. It's like, wow, I can't believe that they could be so happy and have so little. I mean, I remember the first time I went to Russia, it was somewhere in the mid-90s, um, early 90s, and um, I, had, uh, I, was, I, I had turned 17, or turned 16 there in Russia, and, and I remember one of, my, one of the, like, the things that I came back from that was, because my first time being out of the country, first time experiencing a culture, or, or you know, a, a, an impoverished culture at, at that, and, um, and, and it felt like we were just going back 50 years. It's not like that anymore, but at that time, it was like they were, perestroika freedom was just, it was brand new, just a few years uh, into freedom, and, and I remember we were, we were meeting at some house, and, uh, and one of the, the kids in the house took me up to his room and, or took me to his bedroom, and, and over his bed, there was like a picture, it was a poster of a Big Mac, and like it was his dream to be able to have a Big Mac one day. And I'm like, golly, what? <laughs> and, uh, I, and, we, and we leave there going like, how in the world can these people be so happy? And that's what I thought, like these people are just, they seem so happy, and they don't have much. Like, what is this? Like, how is, how is that even possible? And, and, and is, but isn't that, when we, when, we, when we say that, isn't that give evidence to our doubt that you really can be happy with having so little? I mean, I've been in places where the people have, people have family, they have, they have food, they have an education, uh, they have a bed, and yet we still ask the question, how can they be so happy and have so little? Doesn't that give evidence that we tend to equate ha- a happy life with having much? I mean, how can I be truly happy and not have the stuff that, you know, that I want to have? How can I truly be happy if you're making me drink out of a paper straw, right? I mean, I hear people say that we are blessed in this country because of how much that we have. 
Or someone who has a lot, you know, you've, you've, you've done this, you've, you've heard someone say this, maybe you've said it yourself, you, you know, you, you kind of get like someone's like, wow, that's a nice house, wow, nice car, wow, you got that job, wow. And uh, it's like there's a bit of like an embarrassment maybe, and you're like, yeah, I know, God, God's, God's blessed me. But what if that's not really true? What, what if we're not as blessed as we think we are? What if our desire for more has actually removed the blessing of God? Wouldn't then that make sense of why the church here in the U.S. is floundering and the church in third world countries is flourishing? That perhaps in God's economy where the first is last and the last is first, maybe we are the third world country. But with all that in mind, let's jump into this parable that Jesus tells in verse 44 is where he begins. He's going to tell two parables that are really saying the same thing. And so we're going to hit both of them. Verse 44, chapter 13, he says this, this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. There's no question that the overall point of these two stories is the value, is the worth of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. The, The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great value. But if we, if we go a little bit deeper into, these, into what Jesus is saying here, I think we find some other things. Uh, There's some other things that are happening here that Jesus is implying about the kingdom of heaven. And the first thing is this. The value of the kingdom of heaven is not recognized by everyone. Not everybody sees the value of the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who looks at the, at the kingdom of heaven sees what it is worth. So when I was in sixth grade... My dad, uh, my dad was a preacher. He was a, he was a, uh, a pastor uh, for, I think, 14 years, and then he went into full-time evangelism, traveled the country and, and the world, and preached. And, but when I was in sixth grade, he was pastoring, pastoring a church. We were living up near Cleveland, and, uh, and he, went, he got invited by another church to come and preach, and I think it was out of state because we weren't with him. And so he went and, and preached at this church, and then he came back. And when he came back, he had this box of baseball cards that somebody gave him um, to give to his, his, his son, and uh, gave, gave to me. And so he... Uh, um, brought these box, box of baseball cards and said, hey, somebody gave me these uh, to give to you. And I'm looking through them, like, oh, baseball cards, oh, awesome. And so I'm looking through them, and they're all cards from like the 70s. Um, and I'm like, really? Um, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any, any, of, the, any of the names. And, and uh, so I'm like, okay, great. And so I put them all in a the shoebox, and I put them up, and I didn't really care. And, uh, and then uh, sometime later, dad comes home, and he, he, has, he bought this this like book slash magazine that is uh, that tells you the, the the like the worth of baseball cards. Well, that alone was intriguing to me because like, what do you mean like like baseball cards are worth like money? Like, what are you talking about? And so so I go to that and I bring out the box, the old shoe box of, of, of baseball cards, and I and I start going through my cards and looking them up and finding. And I'll never forget when I found the first card that I owned that was worth a dollar. It's like, are you kidding me? I got a card that's worth a dollar, and I just couldn't believe it. And then, and then I'm going, and then I'm going through, and and, and I found the card. Uh, I found that my I had a 1977 Topps Robin Yount was worth seven bucks. I even know who this guy was, but he was making me rich. I, I was like, this is crazy. And, uh, and so I went from like, this box means nothing, all these old guys, these old cards. And, uh, and then I was going to like flea markets and buying all like the protective covers. And, and, uh, and I had like frames for cards and I would put them up in my, you know, I hung, hung them up in my room and, and, uh, it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. Like a minute ago, I didn't think it was, it worth nothing to me. Then all of a sudden it's like, I can't believe what I have here. This guy, this guy who's walking this field that Jesus is talking about, he's been walking this field perhaps for a long time. He, perhaps this field was on his way to work and he'd walk through the field and walk back through the field and he walked it every day and suddenly he sees something that nobody else sees. He sees this treasure and immediately he's going, I can't believe what I just found. I got to have this. Some of you, you, you look at the kingdom of God, you, you, you see what God has done, you see what God can do. You hear, you see of God's design for your life 
And that how by living according to God's good design that your truest and greatest joy is found in this and you'll find greater peace by living under the reign and the rule of God according to God's good design. And you look at it and you just don't buy it. I mean, you see it. You hear about it. Somebody else tells you about it. But you just don't buy it. You're not really convinced that it's treasure it's not really worth giving up what you, what you have in order to get it. It's not worth giving your life to. Well, why is that? It's because you're holding on to other things that seem to you to be more valuable than what you could get here. There are a lot of people who would rather just hold on to what they have, and so they make a really bad trade, and they trade the treasure out for something comfortable. Every day, people look at the truth, and instead of, they see that it sets you free. They see that, it, that, that, is, that, it is, that there, is, there is something here. There's, but instead of doing something about it, instead of giving your life to God's reign and God's rule, his kingdom, you'll just choose to live in bondage. It's like, yeah, I, I, know, I'm, I know it's bondage. I know it's not satisfying the way that I'm living my life, but hey, it's comfortable. It's not that Christianity doesn't make any sense. It's just that you're afraid that it might cost you more than what you're willing to give up. And it's my hope, and I think that what Jesus is saying here, is that we'd be willing to say, God, if you're real, then I want to, I'm all in. I, I, it, show me that you're real, and when you do, I want to have the courage to do something about it, to give my life to your reign, to your rule, to your good design for my life. This guy, he, he sees the treasure and he goes and he does something about it because, hey, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. Now, let me just stop here for a moment and, and address what could be a dangerous landing point for us if we're not careful. Because we can read this and, and, and think that by reading this and think that God is just some casual observer just waiting for us to come to him, waiting for us to find him. If you've been coming for any amount of time, you know that, that, that oftentimes I'll say something like this, that we, whenever we read the Bible, um, we have to read the Bible by interpreting Scripture with Scripture. Like we can't just bring our own ideas into the Scripture and interpret it that way. we got to look and say, okay, I gotta, what is Scripture saying? Is there another Scripture that is saying something about this Scripture? And so we gotta, we got to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So here's something that we know about the Scripture. The reality of the Bible is that God is the one that is doing the seeking. In the garden, Adam and Eve, they were, um, when Adam and Eve had sinned, it was God. If you remember, God that came looking for them. It wasn't, it was, they didn't come looking for God. It was God that came looking for Adam. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well that God is looking for worshipers. The reality is that we, are all, we all are dead in our sin and we're not looking for God. God is looking for us. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 that nobody, ain't nobody seeking God. No one is seeking after God. And maybe this morning you're going, but, but, but Stephen, you don't understand. I, I'm not really like a church person. I'm not really the religious type, never have been. I'm not, not really into that, but, but I am like, I think I'm searching. I think I'm seeking. I, I, listen, if that is you, that's because God is drawing you to him. God is doing this. And Paul says in Acts that God is not far, but he is close. And so the first, the first kind of big idea that we see in this passage is that we see that not everybody sees the kingdom of heaven for what it really is. Not everybody sees the value for what it is. And the other, another big idea is this, that it's not halfway, it's everything. It's not halfway, it is everything. In both stories, he sells everything he has to get it. Everything. There's nothing off the table. Everything. Everything he has, he, he, he sells it all to get it. A lot of people are jumping in and out. Like, you know, I'll get in for a bit, and, and, and if it's good, I'll hang in there. But if it's not, I'm out. If it gets a bit uncomfortable for me, I'm out. We'll just see how this thing goes. We'll, we'll, see, if, we'll see if this Christianity thing works for me. That's not how the kingdom of heaven goes. A few years ago, I had a guy come into my office, and in his marriage, it was a disaster, just absolutely a wreck. His wife was about to leave him, and, uh, and, and in, that, in, in those moments that we shared, I, I shared the gospel with him. 
And I asked him, just flat out, say, hey, do you, do you want to give your life to follow Jesus? And here's what he said. He said, man, I'll try anything. I'll try anything if that's what it takes. And I, and I told him, that's, that's not what this is. This isn't you trying something. It's, it's everything. It's everything. I mean, can you imagine if we did that in marriage? If, we, if this is the approach we took with marriage? I, I remember um, the night that I proposed to my, my wife. Her family is from Michigan, and, and uh, right on the lake, on, on, on Lake Michigan. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and, and growing up, I, I grew up on Lake Erie, all right? And so I would hear, my wife would tell me, she would, like, she would tell me, her, her family would tell me about how, you know, how the lake is just so great. And in the summer, all they would do is go to the beach and just be on the lake and, and all these things. And I'm like listening to this. I'm like, man, I just wasn't buying it because I'm like, I grew up on the lake. I grew up on Lake Erie. Like, if you went swimming in Lake Erie, like, you came out with, like, a third arm or something. Like, you don't, like, you don't do that. You don't spend, like, you don't spend a lot of time in the lake. But, uh, but, but lo and behold, I, I, anyways, I come to find out Lake, lake Michigan is a, it's a different lake. All right? It's, it's not Lake Erie. And uh, so, anyways, we were at my wife's family. They were all up in, uh, up in Michigan seeing family. And, and, uh, and so I decided to surprise her, and uh, I, was, I, had all, I kind of had this all mapped out, planned out. And so I went up. She didn't know I was coming. And uh, we went to the beach on the lake, and we were walking down that evening, walking down the beach. And I had bought a Bible that had her, like, her new name, like, inscribed at the bottom, like what would be her new name inscribed at the bottom. And, and uh, so I had that Bible in a box in my pants, all right, in, in my, in, like, behind my pants. And, uh, and so I'm walking, so she didn't, like, hoping she doesn't see what's going on, as if this isn't, like, crazy. But, um, and then I had the ring in my pocket. And, uh, and so, so we're walking down, and, and I'm like, you know, yeah, I mean, guys, if you've done this, uh, it's like, what in the world? We dated three years. Like, we know that, we, like, she knows this is coming. I know, that, I mean, it's like, but I'm nervous as I'll get out. I could not, con- I don't know what she, we were talking about. She'd say something. I'm like, what? I don't know. Um, and finally, we just, like, this has got to stop. And so I just stop, and I pull out the Bible and say, hey, you got this for you. And she opens it up, and, and, uh, and she sees it. And so I'm, I get behind her, and while she's opening it up, and I get down on my knee, and, and I hold out the ring. And well, what if I were in that moment where I go to ask her the question, what if I, in that moment, said something like this, hey, so I was just wondering, you want to give this a shot? Be like, maybe a couple months, maybe do this like two or three months, maybe, maybe a year, just see how it goes. What do you think? <laughs> like, she's not going to go for that, right? That's not how this works. That's not how this goes. This, this, isn't, this isn't like the two or three month trial type thing. This is everything. Like, you better have thought that through before you bought that ring, right? Like, you better think that, like, this is, like, on the knee asking, like, that is, hey, I'm in. I'm in the rest of my life, for better or for worse, I'm in this thing. This is what it's about. Or what about, what about when you have kids? Like you're in the hospital, you're holding your child, they hand you your child, but just like, what are you doing? Like giving me this kid. And they hand you the child, and you're not going in that moment going, okay, well, we'll see how this goes, right? <laughs> no, I'll just bring them back if, I, if we need to do that. Like that's not it. Like you, you're in. Like you are in. Like you're all the way in. In this is what Jesus tells us to do. You count the cost because this requires everything. Christianity requires that you sell everything emotionally, spiritually, physically. Nothing is off the table. And yet, we say, God, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. We sing this song, God, yes, I will. Yes, I will. I'll do anything, anything you want me to. You can have it all. You just can't touch this. Whether that be a relationship or it could be stuff, house, car, 401K, it could be your job, it could be a, could be a company, it could be your kids, it could be your marriage, it could be this country, it could be your safety. Whatever it is, it's the thing that for you, if I'm going to have the good life, I got to have this. There's no good life without this. And so we close our hands around it and we say, I'll do whatever you want to do, I'll, or you want me to do, I'll go wherever you want me to go. You, 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 you want, you, I'll do whatever it is, but I just, just know that you can't touch this. You can't have this. I don't even want to talk about it. This is mine. 
So Jesus says, count the cost. Because this requires everything. If you remember a conversation that Jesus had with Peter, Peter had denied Jesus, right? He, he had told him, like, I'll never deny you. I'll never, I mean, I'll go to my death before that ever happened. Sure enough, G Peter denies knowing Jesus three times as they take Jesus off to be crucified. And Jesus is raised from the dead. And where do you find, we find Peter? We find Peter, he's out on a boat doing what he's always done, going back to the life that he's always known, getting his business going again. Jesus goes and seeks him out, has a conversation. Remember the question he asked him? Peter, do you love me more than this? I'm not just asking if you love me. I'm, I'm asking if you love me more than this, like this job, these fish, this business, these friends, this life. You, you love me more than any of this? Remember Jesus had a, there was a, a guy that came to Jesus. He was a, a rich, he had kind of made himself, like made a, a life for himself. I mean, he was doing well at a young age. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'm, I, I want to be in. I want to follow you. I want to be one of yours. Jesus said, great, just, just one thing you lack. But we can take care of that right now. Just go sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the guy says that the guy walked away, not to go sell everything. He walked away sad because he had a lot of stuff. He just wasn't willing to give up. You see, whenever we come to God with our idol and we're going, I want to know you more. I, God, I, I, I want to trust you more. I want to love you more. The first thing that God wants to do is he wants to talk about that idol. He wants to deal with that thing that you, that you believe is essential for your joy for the good life. And God will say, all right, let's talk about what's in your hand. Because we cannot buy the treasure and continue to hold on to our idols. The kingdom of heaven is not simply an add-on to your list of essentials for the good life. I need a family, I need a house, I need this, this, and this, a good job, paying job, and then, yeah, you know, I need Jesus for, you know. That, that's not the way this goes. The kingdom of heaven is either everything or it is nothing. So when Jesus poses the question, will you sell it all and follow me, do you walk away gladly to go sell it all, or do you walk away sad because the cost is just too much? Listen, I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. What you're thinking is, this just doesn't seem fair. This, this just doesn't seem fair. That's because it's not fair. Like It's not even close. It's not fair that we would have to give up so little in light of everything that we're, we're getting. It's not, it's not fair that we, we, we get peace with God. We become adopted by the creator of the universe as sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus, co-heirs with Jesus. Co-heirs with Jesus. What's coming for Jesus it was, is coming for us. We get the love of God poured into our hearts. Faith for today, strength for tomorrow, hope in the unseen. We get purpose and meaning for this life. God lavishes grace upon grace upon grace upon us, which one biblical writer says, and it's going to take him forever to do that. You are, you are absolutely right. It is not fair. So why would he do this? Two reasons. One, he loves us. He loves us. And two, it displays just how glorious he is. It makes much of God, which is why we can sell it all with joy because we got a great deal. Which brings us to the next idea here in verse 44, the second part of verse 44. It says, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. What we got to see here, this is about joy. This is about joy. Some of you have a hard time believing that there is really any joy in doing this, like in serving Jesus. Like for, for you, it's like, well, I do these things because I have to. It's what I'm supposed to do. Why? Because, well, because I'm a Christian. 
And so it's just what I get. It's just what I signed up for. I got to do this. I got to show up there. I got to, you know, do this. I got to pray. I got to read. I got to, you know, do these, these things. And for you, the, it's, obedience is just begrudging. That if God is somehow going to be pleased with me and bless my life, it, it, then I'd better live this way. And so we, we have this idea. We've been fed this version of Christianity that if there's anything that I find joy in, if there's anything that I find enjoyable, then it must, it can't, it, it, there's no way that it could possibly be okay for me to, 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 to do that. It must be wrong. That if I gave my life to Jesus, then that means I said goodbye to happiness and pleasure. And so what, we, what do we do? We pit, maybe we don't say this out loud, but in our mind, in the way that we live, we, we, we pit a life of following Jesus against happiness and joy. And yet throughout the scripture, what you find is that joy is the point. The great preacher, Jonathan Edwards from the 1700s, he's, he said this. He says, God's purpose for my life was that I have a passion for God's glory and that I have a passion for my joy in that glory and that these two are one passion. That God's purpose for my life is to, is to glorify him, is to make much of him, is to reveal who he is, and he's got a passion for my joy. He's got a passion for his glory and a passion for my joy. To, and these two, they're not at odds with one another. They're not in competition. In other words, my greatest purpose in life is to bring God glory, is to show how glorious and satisfying God is by living my life the way that he designed my life to go. And in living my life the way God designed my life to go, that is where I find my greatest joy. But to hold on to anything else while I'm at the same time trying to worship and follow Jesus, what I'm telling the world is that, yeah, I love Jesus, but he's just not enough. So I got to hold on to this. Yeah, I, I, love, I love Jesus, but Jesus, let me tell you, Jesus packaged with financial security, now that's where it's at. Jesus packaged with, you know, with a marriage or with a, you know, this kind of marriage, marriage where I'm kind of, uh, that's where it's at. Jesus packaged with kids, Jesus and a good reputation, Jesus and success. Do you see how Jesus gets no glory in that? We're just telling the world he's just not enough. He's just not quite there. See, we think, we think that bringing glory to God is like, you know, saying nice things about God. That bringing glory to God is like, you know, getting on social media and saying something nice or telling our friends that God is good. But the reality is that when we talk about bringing glory to God, you know, the word glory actually means weight. It means weight. That to bring God glory is that our friends and the people around us would, by our lives, feel the weight of God. That by being around us, they would feel the weight of God. Like, what is God doing in her life? What is God doing in his life? They feel the weight of God. That they would look at our life and, 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 and know that God is real and know that he is involved. And what better way for the world to feel God through your life, to feel his weight, than to look at our lives and to see from our lives that God is all satisfying. I don't need anything else. I don't need anybody else. Not because we just give him credit for all the good things that come along, but even in the bad things, especially in the bad things, in the times where there is pain and confusion, and there are times when I don't have what the kingdom of this world, when, when I don't have what my friends and my family think that somebody needs to have a fully satisfied life, when those things are absent from my life, where there is pain and confusion, when, when there is, when I don't have, when I don't, I'm, I'm out of money, when my relationships are all suffering. But even in those times, my life reveals that I don't need that stuff for my joy. I don't need that stuff to be satisfied. I don't need financial security. I don't need revenge. I don't need to defend my reputation. My identity is in him. I was a sinner for Pete's sake, and he has declared me righteous. I was an orphan, and he has declared me a son, a daughter. 
When the world sees that your joy is found in him, when you trade out all that the world says you need to be happy for a life of glad obedience to him, that is when God gets all the glory. I've, I've quoted this before, but C.S. Lewis said this. It's just such a great quote, just so helpful. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling, around, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy has been offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Too many of us are settling for things like money and new stuff and promotions and vacations. And listen, I'm not saying that there's not some happy times in all of that. I'm not saying that at all. Listen, I like new stuff. I, I like new stuff. I mean, you, you get a new shirt, get a new, new pants, new shoes. I mean, you, you get that. I mean, you feel like you're just, you're, you're just better than everybody else, right? Like, there's just a moment that comes. Like, you're, like hey, I, I see you, but I got new shoes on. I'm kind of on a different plane than you are, right? Just kind of in a different place than everybody else. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, okay, maybe it's just me, all right? All right, maybe that's just me. But, but listen, that feeling, that pleasure, here's the thing. You, that, like, that comes, but it goes away, right? I mean, like, you're not just keep coming back going, man, my, I'm just like, check me out. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, you're kind of getting, okay. You don't feel that. It just kind of goes away. But listen, that feeling that you had, that feeling that, 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 that you, that of pleasure that, that you felt when you got that money, when you, got that, when you bought that thing, what you felt in that moment, there's a God behind that. There's a God behind that. And he has a holiday at sea to offer. That he offers pleasures forever, and you're settling for some new pants, for some temporary pleasure. And here's Jesus with these stories, and he's coming at us, and he's going, hey, stop settling. I have way more for you. There's joy for you in this life and in the life to come. It's the life that Jesus came to purchase for you. As, as the writer of Hebrews said, he said this. He said, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, check this, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You ever, you ever wondered, you ever wondered, like Jesus in the garden, right, in the garden, and he's praying and he's asking, God, take it away. I don't want it. Take it away. Take it away. Remove this. I don't, want to, I don't want this. And yet he does it. He walks in it. You ever wonder, like, well, how did he go? Like, how did he, how did he go from the garden to the cross? The writer of Hebrews just told us, the joy that was set before him, this is how. The joy that was set before him, the joy that was on the other side, despising this shame for sure, the joy that was that God to, or Jesus took upon Himself the wrath of God for us, the, the 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 beatings, the mockery, the 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 crown of thorns, the 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 the, the, the spikes to the hands and the feet, the humiliation. Jesus took upon Himself the wrath of God for our sin. Worse than any of that, He took He took upon Himself separation from His Father, where God turned His back on His Son because of our sin. He took upon himself the wrath of God for your sin because of the joy that was coming on the other side of that. Not simply that you, that you might believe in him. That's not enough. But that you would, what the psalmist says in Psalm 37, that you would delight in him. That you just would find great delight in him. Many have believed not many have delighted in him. And I pray by God's grace we would turn this around. That we wouldn't just be marked by, well, I believe. But I just find my delight in him. 
And so the question I think it leaves us with is that will you buy the field? Like, are you willing to buy the field? Like, would you have the courage to ask God to examine your heart to see, to see what, what is it that I value? What is it that I really want? What is, it the, what is the thing that I'm holding in my hand that's saying this is off limits? That I'm good with Jesus and this, but I cannot imagine a good life today, tomorrow, or my future without this. So let me ask you, what, what do you want that is not waiting for you in Jesus? Like, what would you add to Jesus if you could? Like, I know we certainly wouldn't say that out loud in here, but in your own heart, like, if you could, what would you add to Jesus? What is missing in Jesus that you just can't live without? What has Jesus failed to take into account that you just gotta have to be happy. Listen, you can lie to me, you can lie to yourself, but one day all of our games and all of our excuses will be exposed. And take a look at what you, what you really do with your time, take a look at what you do with your money, take a look and think about what you do with your resources, like what just like, like amps you up and you'll see whatever that, that thing is that you truly value. And maybe today is the day that, you've been acknowledge, that you acknowledge that I've been trying to hold on to both. I've been trying to hold on to Jesus in this idol. You can't have both. And Jesus is worth letting this go for sure. And may we believe that to be true. Let's pray together.